in a series the past few weeks called When God Doesn't Make Sense. Perhaps you've noticed the theme of this. We've looked at uh, why did God place the tree in the garden of evil, not, uh, the tree in the garden of Eden, this tree that was the knowledge of good and evil. Why does it even have to be there? We've looked at uh, what is hell all about, what's Satan all about the past few weeks. This morning, it's going to get a bit more personal. It's going to be a little bit more heavy. Um, and I pray that it would be um, beneficial for all of us as we look at um, and analyze the question, why does God allow suffering? As we've looked through this series, we've had this theme verse, and we have to come to grips with the idea that ultimately there are things that we're just not going to understand. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, talks about that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. There are things in this world that God is choosing to keep secret from us. Now, one day we will come into, to experience and understand these things, but for the time here, there are simply going to be moments where we're not going to understand but he does promise that he gives us enough. He gives us enough answers that is for ourselves, but not only for ourselves, but also for our children. And so we have to grab hold of those things, but also not stop pursuing those things that are confusing, those things that are hard. And that's what we've been doing in this series. You've been there. We know that in our church, Christian culture, it's there. There are oftentimes these things within the Christian faith that we kind of ignore. Why do bad things happen to good people is a common question. People outside of the church will, will ask these questions. How could a good God allow people to suffer? legitimate question, right? Oftentimes when we hear these types of questions, we run away, we hide, we pray that we don't get asked that question because they're really difficult to answer. This morning we're going to do our best to dive into this concept of why does God allow suffering at all? And to do that, we're going to be looking at a guy named Job. Really familiar um, passage, a familiar book of the, of the Bible, considered by many to be the, the greatest literary work within all of the Bible. It's an incredible poem, 42 chapters of poetry, where you see this huge, wide range of human emotion. And in this, in this book, you have this guy named Job. He's referred to as blameless and upright. He's extremely wealthy and successful. And in chapter 1, after he's introduced, you see this conversation between God and Satan. And they're talking about Job. In this conversation, basically, God allows Job to be tested, to be tried by Satan. Satan thinks that if, if he punishes Job, then ultimately that Job will turn his heart on God. God's like, nah, he's my boy. We're good. Is it all going to be all right? But God allows him to do it. So therefore, Satan comes down into, Satan, into Job's world. And he says... I'm going to kill your animals. Doesn't seem that intense, except for when we recognize that ultimately the livestock that Job possessed would have been a great amount of wealth. Much of the success that he would, had earned was based on these animals that he had. Satan comes and he kills all of them in a moment. And that seems horrible. It seems hard to grasp. You understand that would be difficult if any of our, our businesses all of a sudden you... Um, something tragic happens to your business, we would, we would weep for you. We would be sorrow for you. You would experience suffering there. But Satan didn't end there. After that, he goes and he kills all of Job's servants, all of his employees. So not only are all of his animals killed, Satan then goes and kills all of Job's servants, all of them. And you can imagine this, the, the devastation that would be on Job's life, right? It's incredible sorrow, confusion. But most of us know that it doesn't end there. Because after jo Satan kills Job's animals and he kills Job's servants, he goes after Job's kids and he kills all of Job's children. It's really easy sometimes to read the Bible and skip through passages like this and just say, and Job's ki kids were kid killed and you just keep going. But I think it's important that we start to place ourselves in the story, that we can really begin to resonate with where Job is. For those of us in this room that we have kids, it doesn't take but just for a moment of imagining something horrific to happen to your children, that you begin to experience or feel the pain that would be associated with it. But it wasn't just that Job's one kid got sick, or all of his kids got sick, every single one killed at the end of chapter 1, you see Job sorrow, sorrowful, distraught, but he didn't turn on God. He refuses to curse him. In chapter 2, Satan and God have another conversation. And Satan's like, okay, so he didn't turn his back on you, God, yet. Well, here's the thing. Certainly, if I take away his health, he'll turn on you. And God says, go ahead. He's my boy. He ain't going to turn. 
but you can try. Only you have to spare his life. Do whatever. Satan comes down and he causes Job to have his horrible skin condition. These um, blisters and sores appeared all over his body. Not only was Job in excruciating pain, but also the people that recognized him and know him the best, like they seemed, he seemed unrecognizable to them. Even his own wife found him detestable to the point where she didn't want to be with him, and she said, Job, you should just curse God and die. People say, well, why didn't uh, God, uh, Satan kill Job's wife? Because he knew it was worse for her to be alive and to still curse. You, you know what I'm saying? A nagging wife deal. Not fun, right? We don't want that. Then what happens, these three friends show up, and Job's going through a really hard time, right? He's distraught. They come, and they're so overwhelmed by emotion that they begin to mourn and weep, and they actually just sit with Job for seven days. I don't know if you've ever had any moments of awkward silence where you have these awkward turtle moments with people. This is seven days, right, of them just sitting in a circle, just crying, silent. No advice is given. I don't even know if they, how they slept. I don't know if they ate. I don't know what was going on, but we know that there was no wisdom imparted, no counsel was given except for that they were just there. Just a little side note. Ultimately, when I'm feeling pain or when you're feeling pain, whenever we wanted to meet the needs of other people, oftentimes the best thing we can do is not say anything. It's just to be with them. That's a great thing. Sadly, though, his friends started to talk after seven days. And some of the counsel they gave was horrible. Thankfully, Job ends up rejecting it. Another dude shows up. Some of the counsel he gives uh, was, not, was, was good, and then some of it was not so good. God ends up stepping in, intervening, and speaking on behalf, speaking to Job. And through it all, we see that Job, he never curses God. And because of his faithfulness, God ends up blessing Job with twice as much as he had before. Twice as much. There's 42 chapters of Job in just a, a few minutes. We're going to be talking tonight about why does God, this morning, about why God allows suffering. But before we do that, I want us to talk about um, how to approach it. What, what do we do? Uh, when, God, when we ask God why something happens, it's important that we understand that He's going to respond to us in one of two ways. The first way that he, is he's going to give us understanding. We love it when God gives us understanding about something. Why, God, did I interview, that, interview for that job and not get it? It's e we love it when a week later another or a better job opens up and we're excited because we recognize that ultimately God didn't allow us to have that job so that we can have something better. Some of you have been in a relationship and you thought he was the one, right? Or you thought she was the one and ultimately it fails and you reckon you're in the middle of it, you're, you're suffering, you're, you're overwhelmed, you're frustrated at God, but then a couple weeks go by and you realize that the guy was a jerk and ultimately God brings someone else into your life and you recognize that you're far better off. We love it when God gives us understanding. Sadly, though, he doesn't always give us understanding. Um, sometimes he gives us peace that surpasses understanding, which to be honest is probably more important than the understanding itself. In Philippians chapter 4 verse 7, it says that, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts, your minds through Christ Jesus. Ultimately, God may not give you the reason why you didn't get the job or why you didn't get the relationship. He might not give you answers as to why this relationship or this friendship is suffering, struggling. He may not tell you why you're struggling with some type of sickness or ill. Ill ailment. He might not tell you why someone had to pass away, but ultimately I believe, as the Bible teaches, that if we pray for God to give us understanding, and he doesn't, he promises that he will give us peace that surpasses all understanding. So when we pray to God, he's either going to give us understanding or peace that surpasses it. But here's the deal. How do we really have peace in the midst of suffering? That's what we all want. Even if we don't understand why, we want to be able to have peace through it. And so let's look at the life of Job and try to figure out how did Job have peace in the midst of suffering and see if we can learn a few things to apply it to our lives. First point is this. If you want to have peace in the midst of suffering, you need to trust in God's sovereignty. This word sovereignty just means having ultimate control or ultimate power, having supreme power. We believe that God is not just sovereign um, and having power, but he's, his sovereignty is a, is a good thing. It's a powerful thing. We need to understand that God is in complete control, that ultimately, though, his plan for our lives is better than our own. To trust in God's sovereignty recognizes that God, no matter what you want for my life, even if I don't like it and even if I don't want it, I'm okay with it because that ultimately you are sovereign and I trust in you. We notice, we see this in Job in chapters 1 and 2 and it says, while, while God was allowing Satan to mess with Job's life, 
He sets limits on what Satan can take or what Satan can do. In chapter 1, verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he, being Job, has in your power is in your power. But on the man himself do not lay a finger. That's when Satan goes down and kills Job's livestock, his servants, and his kids. He doesn't touch Job. Why? Not because, not, not because that's just what he wanted to do, but because God set a limit and said, No, Satan, you can't do it. In chapter 2, God does give Satan the authority to go and touch Job's health, but he says, but you cannot take his life. Ultimately, we have to understand that there are everything that happens in our life. And this doesn't, we don't like this idea, it's hard to imagine, but everything that happens to us is allowed by God. And we have to get to a point where we just trust that ultimately God is sovereign. This idea and this concept is found in Romans 8, verse 28. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who are called called according to his purpose. We need to understand that no matter what happens to us, no matter what situations may come our way, that ultimately God is working for our good, even if what we go through doesn't seem good. It doesn't seem good that I have cancer. It doesn't seem good that my, my uncle just passed away. It doesn't seem good that this relationship failed. We have to get to a point when we really trust in God's sovereignty, we recognize that everything that happens to us, whether we perceive it as good or whether we perceive it as bad, for those that are called according to his purpose and love him, then ultimately everything happens for a reason. Now, I just want to take a time out for a moment and recognize that some of you that are in the middle of suffering, I I know that me coming to you and saying, listen, it's all happening for a reason. Get over it. I recognize that's not a good approach. I know you don't want that. It's hard to really move past your suffering and past your pain. You can't just will yourself up and say, okay, I'm not going to suffer anymore. God's good. Things are, this, it doesn't really work that way. But my prayer is that you would fight and you would pray that God would help you to trust in his ultimate sovereignty. In the middle of whatever we are going through, we can know that ultimately God is in control. And now that may not bring some of you comfort because you're thinking, well, if God is in control of my situation, why isn't he stepping in to do something about it? Some of us, that's the primary limiter of why we're not really pursuing Jesus in a powerful way because we still can't get over what happened to our family, to our parents, to our grandparents, what's happened to us. We struggle with that. We see that Job, he struggled with what he was going through, but he still chose he still chose to trust. We see that in chapter 1, verse 20, his, his animals, his, live, his livestock, his um, servants, and his kids, they've just died. And he says this, it's that this Job got up and he tore his rope. He ripped his clothes off. I don't encourage y'all to do that this morning right now. And he shaved his head. I, sh- I shaved my head last night, but that wasn't because of this. He, he's emotional. And he fell to the ground in worship and said this. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Here's the deal. It's really easy to trust in God's sovereignty when he's the giver. He gave his son. We trust in that. It's easy to celebrate that and find joy in that. He gives us a relationship. God, thank you for the relationship. He allows us to have a job. God, thank you for this job. He gives us that scholarship. God, thank you for that scholarship. It's easy to rejoice in the good things, the things that he gives us. But the trust in God's sovereignty isn't limited to to focusing and worshiping him just because of what he gives. We have to also recognize that he is a God that not only gives, but he's also a God that takes away. In limiting your worship of him and your trust in him just because you don't like the idea that sometimes he takes things from you that you don't like ultimately is not a genuine faith at all. Second point, second advice in regards to having peace in the midst of suffering is to not cover up your pain. We see that Job didn't do that in chapter 1, verse 20. He's ripping his robe. He's shaving his head. He's distraught. But he's still pushing towards faith. It's okay to not be okay. Listen, all of us in this room, we're all messed up. One of the things I like to say is that because we're all messed up from the floor up, there's no reason in covering it up. We don't need a church culture in which we all walk in and feel like we can't be real about what we're going through. Because the truth is, the person beside you may be going through the greatest amount of suffering that they've ever gone through. And you may not know it. For those of you that are in this room and you're dealing with suffering, I want to encourage you not to, to cover it up. I want a little side note, though. I also want to talk to those of you who are really good at not covering up your pain. Like, you're so good at it that you're, like, you know how to tweet about your pain, and like, you don't even need 140 characters. You just let the world know, I am in pain, and you want everyone to know about it. 
Your Facebook posts are getting longer and longer. They're getting more often and more often. Just woe is me, woe is me. This idea of you just want to let the world know. And you're looking at this point and say, man, I am, I am being obedient. I am not covering up my pain, right? That's not the point here. Listen, we're not called to have this woe is me attitude. But we are called to be real. And so I would encourage you to find a few people, brothers and sisters, who have a strong faith. A faith that you look at them and you admire who they are in Jesus. And you go to them for advice. You go to them for counsel. You go in there just to grieve and to share what you're going through. Find a small group. Get plugged in there. Pray with someone. Let them know. Some of you, you've got some real stuff going on in your life. And so, yeah, maybe you need to talk with someone that's further along. Or maybe you need to talk to a counselor. I don't know what that is for you, what that step should be. But I would encourage you not to cover it up. Not to cover up your pain. But here's the thing. Some of you, you're being real about your pain. You're doing it in a fairly healthy way. But I would say that if you're being more open about what you're going through with your friends, with your small group, with your counselor, then you are with God. And you got your priorities out of order. If you're talking to your friends and you're weeping, snot's coming out of your face, and you're overwhelmed by the situation that you're in, and then when you pray to God, you pray the Sunday school type of prayer in which you're not even able to be real with him, listen, your view of God is far too small. We serve a God, just like in the case of Job, that can handle our frustration. He can handle our pain. In Job chapter 3, if any of y'all want to be depressed this afternoon, read Job chapter 3. You can either do that or watch the Carolina Panthers play football. It's up to you. It's up to you. In Job chapter 3, he has this long lament, fancy word, right? And he is in pain. I want you to try to place yourself where he is. At this moment, his business, gone. His family is either dead or like his wife, is turned away from him. And his body is in immense pain where people that he thought cared about him are finding him detestable. Don't want anything to do with him. And he writes this in Job 3, verse 11. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? For now I would be lying down in peace. I would be asleep and at rest with kings and rulers of the earth who built for themselves places now lying in ruins, with princes who had gold who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not hidden away in the ground like a stillborn child, like an infant who never saw the light of day? There the wicked cease from turmoil, and there the weary are at rest. Captives also enjoy their ease. They no longer hear the slave drivers shout. The small and the great are there. And the slaves are freed from their owners. I don't know if you really call that the weight of that section. But Job is basically saying, God, why was I even born? Why am I alive? Some of you have been there. Most likely some of you, even in this moment, are struggling with that thought. Job is wishing that he was just a stillborn child. He says it would have been better off that his mother's knees weren't there to to welcome him. Basically, it would have been better that I was born, they cut the cord, they left me there on the ground, and they went on their own way. Job is in pain. We focus on the story of Job, and we focus on like chapter 42 when he gets to see God, and he's victorious. But in the midst of this pain... We see that Job was extremely broken. And it's okay to not be okay. Third point is this. Continue to trust where you find no perspective. I don't know about you, but I love to to see why things happen. I like to understand why things happen. The most common question we all ask when suffering happens is, God, why did this happen to me? Why me? Why now? Why him? Why her? Some of you guys, you've asked to grow out and she said no, and you're like, God, why not, right? You've been there. We all want to know why. One of my favorite verses in this entire book is found in Job chapter 13, verse 15. At this moment, Job doesn't understand exactly why things are happening. He doesn't know what's going on. He's frustrated. And notice what he says in verse 15 of chapter 13. He says, though he, being God, slay me, Yet will I hope in him. Job 
It's saying that, God, even though you're killing me, I'm still going to hope in you. What other choice does he have? God, you're the giver of life. I will choose and I will fight to hope in you. He says later in chapter 19, we'll talk about this verse more specifically later, in 19 verse 35, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. Jesus, uh, Job is having this, this hope for this Redeemer that's going to come and save him from the pain. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. He is hoping, he is trusting, even in the midst where he finds no perspective. Tim Keller says it this way, Job never saw why he suffered, but he saw God, and that was enough. You know, a faith that trusts in the Lord when things are good, yet your faith diminishes when things don't, isn't a faith that's genuine. We should desire a faith like Job that says, even when everything in my life is taken away and my health is failing, I will trust in the Lord, not because of how he's blessed me, but because of who he is. We should desire a faith like that of Daniel, that even though he knew he was going to be thrown into a pit of lions, he stayed firm. Why? Because a faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. Listen, church, the world doesn't need a group of believers, people that are identifying as followers of Jesus, that worship him when things are good, yet turn their back on him when things aren't. The church, the world needs a church that's willing to stay firm through the fire. Why? Because a faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. And so those are a few ways to encourage you how to have peace in the midst of suffering. And I hope those are good, but here's the deal. I recognize that some of you may be thinking, Josh, this is good, um, but you haven't actually answered the question at all, right? What is the deal? How do, why does God allow suffering? I want to say that there are a lot of reasons why God could allow the suffering that you've gone through, the suffering that you're going through, and the suffering that you may be getting ready to go into. There's ultimately a lot of reasons I can be there. I was studying for this, looking at articles and um, just different um, concordances and uh, commentaries. There were, there's different um, opinions about how many types of suffering there are. One guy had listed 14 different types. We're going to look at three um, for today, and I hope that's okay. We're going to talk. This is a non-exhaustive list of why God allows us to suffer. What is the purpose of suffering? The first point is this. Is that God allows suffering to lead us to Repentance. Suffering is ultimately a call for us and others to turn from treasuring anything on earth above God. There's this story in Luke chapter 13, and we only see it here, and Jesus is talking to these disciples, and he's telling them about um, this idea of suffering and repentance. And he says this in verses 4 and 5. He says, this is in the middle of the story, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Basically, there's these 18 people that die because this tower falls on them. Really hor horrific. And Jesus basically asked, do you think that those 18 people that died, do you think they're any worse than the people that didn't die? And he's like, no. But ultimately, unless you repent, unless you turn away of your life of sin and run towards Jesus, you will all likewise perish, even on, either in this earth, in this life, or in the next. I think most of us can relate to that where we've gone through trials, we face adversity, we faced pain, and it's led us to the cross. Because we've gotten to a point where our brokenness has led us, left us with no hope. And so we've chose to anchor our hope in the Lord. That should be our prayer for everyone that's enduring pain and suffering. Ultimately, we see that either the pain that we experience or the pain that other people go through, it leads us to repentance. Second point is this. God allows per, uh, suffering sometimes to rid us from worldly reliance. Similar theme. Suffering is a call for us and others to turn from treasuring anything on earth above God. And so sometimes suffering helps rid us from reliance on the world. And so yes, tomorrow you go to work and your business starts falling apart. The question I have is, is your, is your faith and is your trust anchored in what you do? Or is it anchored in whose you are? My question for, for those of you that your relationship is going really well and you're thinking that this person is good for you, what happens when that doesn't work out the way you think? Is your, is your faith and is your hope anchored in that relationship? Is your identity placed in him or her? Is it placed in, in Jesus? We don't understand why Hurricane Matthew came. We don't understand why the flood happened. We don't understand that some of the people that were the most greatly affected were some of the poorest people in our communities. Does it make sense? 
I don't know all the clarity and all the reasons behind it, but I do have two prayers that go into that. My first prayer is that the people that were suffering were able to see the hands and feet of Jesus working through his church. And the second point is this, that ultimately my prayer is that even though I hate that they lost their things, I hope and pray that in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their trial, in the midst of their struggle, they would recognize that their TVs and their homes and all of their possessions ultimately don't give them anything. And their hope is only anchored in Jesus. My prayer is that they would see that. Oftentimes, God allows suffering to rid us from worldly reliance. Some of you, your health is starting to deteriorate. And you've placed your, your perspective, you've placed your identity in this workout or being able to do your job. And he's starting to take that from you. You can feel it. You're not the person you once were. Your identity is not found in what you do. It's found in what he did. The third point is this, and it's probably the most important important point. I'm not skipping a verse. And verse, the point there, three is to remind us of the suffering of Jesus. We see this idea of wanting to be able to relate to Jesus, to endure pain so we can more greatly connect with him and understand and relate to Jesus. We see it most greatly and clearly in the life of a guy named Paul. And he writes to the church in Philippi, in Philippi in chapter 3 verse 10. He says, that I may know him, being Jesus, and the power of his resurrections, resurrection and may share his sufferings. Most of us don't wake up in the morning hoping that we can relate to the pain and the torture that Jesus endured. But Paul longed for that. He longed to be able to share in the suffering that he did. He knew that being able to more greatly understand and appreciate what Jesus went through would ultimately help him to believe and have a more genuine faith in what he did. And to be able to more greatly appreciate the suffering he endured. Keller had another quote that I thought was of timely. It's that Jesus is the ultimate Job, the only true innocent sufferer. What does he mean by that? Here we have in this story this guy, Job, by what refers to as blameless, upright, successful. But we also know that while he may be those three things, we also know that he was human, and therefore he was sinful because the Bible says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so while it doesn't make sense and we look at this story and we say, God, why did you do that to Job? That seems horrible. Ultimately, we recognize that he's suffering as a sinful being. And we see that Jesus is the ultimate Job, the only true innocent sufferer. That Jesus, being in the form of God, didn't count equality with God as something to be grasped, but instead humbled himself to come and serve and to heal and to teach, but not only to do things, but to die for us. Jesus being this perfect God, count it all worthwhile to come and suffer on our behalf. And so as we look at Job, my heart is that going forward from this morning, that we're not just going to look at it as this story in which we see a guy suffer well, but instead we're going to see that this story of Job is really a story that points to Jesus. I want to illustrate this in just a couple more minutes. Chapter 9 of Job, verses 33 through 34. Job's longing for this mediator, this person that could intercede in between, in between him and God. And he says, if only there was someone to mediate between us, God, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's, from, God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. Job, in the midst of his suffering and his pain, is longing to be able to communicate God in a way that all of us can freely do this morning. This God who not only sent his son, but he also spent and sent his spirit to live within every one of us. And so in the midst of our suffering, we know that God has sent his spirit, this comforter, to be with us, to encourage us, to lift us up when we are down, to help us place our identity in him. Job is longing for that, and Jesus is like, I am that. I have come for us. And so when we suffer, our suffering is already different than Job because we already have that mediator. It doesn't end there. We, as I mentioned earlier, in Job chapter 19, verse 35, he, Job is longing for this redeemer, I know that my Redeemer lives, he says, and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. Ultimately, in the midst of Job's suffering, he knows that this Redeemer is going to come, whether it happens in his lifetime or not. He knows that a Redeemer one day will come. Well, I've got good news, family, because Jesus is the ultimate Redeemer, and nothing we can face in this life will ever pale in comparison to what he faced for us and what he's already conquered for us. We don't fight from victory, for victory, we fight from victory because Jesus has already won it. And so yes, what we're going through sometimes it stinks, it's hard, and I'm sorry. We're not always going to have the answers, but ultimately we have to know that we serve a God who has died for us, and ultimately we may not get redeemed, and we may not feel, face healing here in this world, but ultimately, if we have perspective 
that's found in the fact that in this lifetime, the worst thing that can happen to us is that we die and go be with him. How amazing is that? You want to kill me? Well, that stinks. There are a lot of things on this earth that I'm going to lose, that I'm going to miss out on. But ultimately, I have joy in knowing that the next minute, I'm going to be walking up in heaven with my father. And I'm telling you, you guys look awesome, but you're nothing compared to him. We should have that hope and that faith because our pain should remind us of the suffering of Jesus. I want to tell a story about this guy named Horatio. His name is Horatio Spafford. Him and his wife, Anna, they had five kids. He had a little boy and four girls. And um, Horatio and Anna, they had a really successful business, but sadly in 1871, their little boy, he passed away. He got pneumonia um, and he died. The same year, his business started to fall apart. Things weren't going as well as he had hoped. A couple of years went by, his business had started to turn around, and him and his family, they were set to go to Europe for a trip. Um, and while they were on the, on the way to the ship, or a day before the ship, that they were supposed to leave on the ship for Europe, uh, a business emergency came up, and so Horatio had to stand behind, stay behind in America to deal with something in his business, and he went ahead and sent his wife and his four girls on the boat to Europe. As many of you probably see where this is going, the boat on the way to Europe collided with another boat. It sank, most of the people on board died of which were Horatio and Anna's four kids, the four little girls. Anna thankfully survived. A rescue boat was able to pull her up out of the water, bring her to safety. She's able to get a message back to Horatio back in America that she had survived, but their kids were dead. Horatio obviously being distraught in pain that's almost unimaginable and unthinkable. A man of God, he chooses to get on the next boat he can, and he's going to go to Europe to be with his wife, to be able to console her, to grieve with her. While he's on the boat, um, he's informed while they were out at sea that the spot underneath where they were was about the same location as where the boat that his wife and his four girls were on, where it sank. And so as he's on this boat sailing to Europe, he's informed that basically right underneath him are the bodies of his four girls somewhere at sea. In the midst of that pain, longing to be with his wife, longing to grieve with his wife, Horatio sits down in prayer to God and he writes down these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ, hence to live. If Jordan above me shall roll, no pain shall be mine, for in death as in life thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. But Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest of my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Even though you have not come back yet, even so, it is well with my soul. Even though my business is gone, even though I've lost all, all five of my kids within a period of, of two years, you have died for me, and your blood has ransomed me. You have redeemed me, and ultimately because of that, I know that it is well with my soul. For those of you this morning, in the middle of pain, 
I want to let you know right now that I don't understand at your level what exactly you're going through. I can't tell you exactly why God is allowing you to go through what you're going through. And while it may not be extremely comfortable, comfortable or extremely comforting for me to say that God has a purpose behind your pain, I want to tell you that he has a purpose behind your pain. For those of you this morning, and you're going through trials, you're suffering, something's going on in your life, and you're apart from a relationship with Jesus, ultimately I'm telling you the purpose of the pain that you're feeling right now is to lead you to repentance, lead you to him. We believe that the gospel says that Jesus came and lived a life that we couldn't live and died a death that we deserved and that by coming and placing our faith in him, trusting in him, no matter what the circumstances are, that ultimately he will save us, he would redeem us. We can have everlasting life with him. And there is no greater joy than having this, this eternal security, knowing that your, your, your life and your eternal existence has been paid for by the, the blood of Jesus. Others of, in this, of us in this room, like we've placed our faith in him. But we recognize that when it comes to God being Lord of our life, that it's, it's probably not entirely accurate. Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Ultimately, a lot of us are really good at accepting the giving God. But when it comes to taking away, denying what we think is best for ourselves and trusting in him, that's hard. For those of you that are there, I want to pray that you would be able to surrender and sink in. The pain and the suffering you're enduring is to try help rid you of this worldly alliance. And all of us in this room, the pain and the suffering that we are going through and that we're enduring, while it may not make sense, there is great joy in knowing that there's no pain that we can face that Jesus hasn't already paid for and he hasn't already gained victory from. So my prayer is that what you're going through, what you've gone through, or what you're going to go through at some point will help lead you and direct you to the pain and the suffering that he endured. Let's pray together. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We're thankful that your mercy is new every morning, but ultimately you're a God that saves, you're a God that redeems, but you're a God that cares and loves. A God that even before we were born, you knit us together in our mother's womb. And that you have a plan for our lives. You have a purpose for our lives. And my prayer, God, is that everyone that's going through a trial, that is about to go through a trial, that you would prepare our hearts to understand and be able to face it well. To have faith well. Not for our own good, but for your glory. And so that the people around us can see that you're a God that is worthy of praise. You're a God that can be trusted. You're a God that we can place our faith and our hope in in spite of our circumstances. For those that are here this morning and are apart from you, God, my prayer is that right now, even as I'm speaking, that you would help them know that you are real and that you love them and that you've called them according to your purpose. I pray that they would give their life to you. If that's you, you have a card inside, inside your worship guide, you can mark down that you made a decision. You can go and talk to our prayer team in a minute. You can come talk to a pastor. We'd love to pray with you and encourage you. For everyone that's here, God, I pray that you would just help us all just to face adversity well. That ultimately that we would recognize that things are not always going to make sense. But there is beauty that comes in knowing you and knowing that you're in control. Help us to have faith. Help us to trust in you, even when it doesn't make sense. We thank you for this time. It's in your names that we pray. In the name of Jesus. And everyone said. Amen. Amen. Can we give God a hand of praise, church? He's good.